Good morning again, everyone. You're very welcome. Is this working? Is there a better sign in the corner? Yep. I'm just going to pray for God's word before we begin. Let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come this morning to ask you, please, that by your Holy Spirit, you would shed light upon your word, that you would give us wisdom and understanding, that you would help us, Lord, to apply your word. You're always speaking, Lord. We're so busy in our lives that we shut out the voice of God, but you're always speaking, and today, Lord, we want to take these moments to hear what it is that you're saying to us. Please give us ears to hear. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus that when the Spirit of God prompts us this morning, when he speaks to us this morning, when our conscience is pricked this morning, that, Lord, we would respond with faith. We would respond accordingly and come to you, Lord God, in humble, humble desire, Lord God, to know you, a humble desire, Lord God, to have that intimacy with you that enables us to know, Lord, that the way of Christ, the way that has been opened because of Christ, the way to you, Lord God, for us, is a means, Lord God, that draws us by your Spirit to the throne of grace, where we can find grace and help to meet us in our time of need. Lord, may this living and active world do its work. May people, Lord, be left today with what it is that God is saying, and may they carry that word on throughout this week, hearing and feeding on the word of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at the four fours, F-O-R, the four fours, there's actually six, but I only think the four best ones. Um, the four fours in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. And it was written by the Apostle Paul concerning the gospel of Jesus. And I just remind people that the gospel means good news. A lot of people see things about believe in the gospel and all this, and don't actually know what that means. It's good news about Jesus. And Paul, who once despised Christians and the message that they preach, he had his life completely transformed by the gospel, by the good news about Jesus. And he could later say these words, for, that's the first one, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Firstly, Paul wasn't ashamed of the gospel. What about you this morning? Can you say that, Christian? Can you put your hand on your heart and say like Paul, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. You see, I watch and I listen and I see, and I'm not passing judgment on people, but I see people who profess to be Christians living as the world lives. And that says to me, they're ashamed of the gospel. Because if they want to live as the world lives, what they're saying is, I don't want to live according to the gospel. I don't want to obey the truth of the gospel. Then there are others who, they're scared to speak out and say, I am a Christian. I can't get involved as I can't do this because I am a Christian. I want to live as Jesus has, would have me live and I want to follow Jesus. And when people don't do that and they don't take that stand, it leads me to the conclusion that perhaps they're ashamed of the gospel. And then there's an even more scarier one, which is this. That people live in such a way that they don't look like they're any different than the unbelieving world. And when the unbelievers look at them and say, is that Christianity? Well, if that is Christianity, I want no part of it. And they actually become responsible for making unbelievers ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. He lived it. He demonstrated it. In fact, he would eventually, according to the truth, to tradition, he would eventually be beheaded because of his unashamed love of the gospel. Paul knew that it was the power, the dynamite, the miraculous ability of God, among other things, to bring the dead back to life. Now, we're not seeing physically people being raised back from the dead. I hope to see that in my lifetime because I believe it. In the word of God. I believe, and I've always said to the Lord, if I die without raising someone from the dead, you're going to have to suffer me for all eternity asking why. 
But the gospel is God's dynamite. It just blows people's lives apart. And it gets rid of the old life and brings them into this new creation in Christ. It, it transforms lives. It brings them back from being dead in trespasses and sins to life in God. Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation. He's not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. And we looked last week about that. And deliverance from harm, from ruin, or from loss. Deliverance from sin and its consequences. How incredible is that? He's saying, this is, this is God's power to deliver the most vilest sinner. This is God's power to cleanse the most wicked sinner of all sin. This is God's power to deliver from harm, from ruin, from loss, deliverance from sin and its consequences. And what does he say then? Not only I am not ashamed, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. It's all inclusive. No one is left out of God's salvation plan. You see, there's always this big argument about predestination and election, and I believe in election, and I believe in predestination. <coughs> but there will be nobody in hell because it's God's fault. <laughs> Nobody's going to be sitting in hell saying, see that God, he cast me here. He's wrong, he's got this one wrong. God is just, God is righteous, God never does anything wrong. If people finish up in hell, and if you're watching this morning, if you're listening this morning, and you finish up in hell, God forbid, but if you do, you're not going to be able to believe to blame God. Because God's gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is all inclusive. For whosoever believes. If you end up in hell, it's because you have chosen not to believe God's only means of salvation. No matter who, how powerful the gospel is, and Paul says it is the power of God. Even though the gospel of Jesus is powerful, and we can see even in this hall today how lives have been transformed by the power of that gospel. Even though the gospel of Jesus is powerful, it is utterly powerless to help those who will not believe. It's an act of your will. Not to believe. Now we can get into again the debate about the move of the Spirit of God. <clears throat> but it is an act of your will not to believe. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerless to save, to deliver from harm, from ruin, from loss, to deliver from sin and its consequences those who refuse to believe it. See, remember what we've been saying for a number of weeks? You cannot impose your religious and views upon others. Neither can God. He can't impose the gospel upon you. So let me ask a simple question. How do you think you will get to heaven if you don't believe the gospel? Because the gospel is God's only power for salvation for whoever believes. There's no other way. If you think there's another way to get to heaven, you're deluded. You're fooling yourself. It is the only way to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask a question this morning and see if anybody knows this. You can put your hand up and answer, and I'll not be a fool of you to get it wrong. Have you ever heard of anyone being called an absurd hero? Have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard that term? Someone is an absurd <coughs> hero. Sounds a bit bonkers, doesn't it? Well, there's a philosophical thought, this is deep thinking stuff in this one. There's a philosophical thought that's called the absurdity of existence. The absurdity of existence. Now, it doesn't mean that it's absurd to think that human beings exist. As Descartes says, Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. We know we exist. If you come up and stick a pin in me, I'll scream. I am not an apparition. I'm not a figment of your imagination. I exist. You exist. The absurdity of existence means the struggle between the human tendency 
to look for the meaning in life. And what the French philosopher Albert Camus says, or described as, the silent answer of the universe. That there is no inherent meaning in life. How incredible is that? The absurdity of existence means the struggle between the human tendency to look for meaning in life and what the French philosopher Camus described as the silent answer of the universe. The universe is supposed to be telling us there actually is no inherent meaning in life. So what you've got on one hand is meaning in life versus no meaning yeah. in life. Yeah. Okay? <clears throat> meaning in life versus no meaning in life. That is the absurdity of existence. And the absurd comes uh, from the conflict between human expectations and reality. And that will sound very high to it. Let me explain it. Sometimes we face different things in life. We have all of these expectations. But our expectations and our hopes aren't necessarily our reality. And so that allows unbelief and doubt and all of those things that creep into our lives and make us question is there any purpose? Is there any meaning in life? A lot of people face harsh realities, difficult life challenges which lead them to believe life has no meaning or no purpose. And so we see, for example, an upsurge in suicide statistics. When you look at the pandemic and, and the lockdown and the impact that that had on many people, they thought, many people thought, there is no meaning in life, there is no purpose in life. And so, we saw a rise in suicide statistics. People who commit suicide are led to believe that there's no reason to live, that there's no purpose or no meaning in life. Others commit what's called philosophical suicide. Big flashy words again, but listen to what it means. Others commit what's called philosophical suicide by fooling themselves into believing that life has meaning. This is the, the absurdity of existence. Others commit what's called philosophical suicide by fooling themselves into believing that life has meaning just to cope with the truth of a meaningless existence. So let me explain this again. People try their best, fool themselves into believing, delude themselves into believing that there is some sort of meaning in life because they just do not want to cope with the fact that there is no meaning. So they create all of this stuff around them to help them cope with life. And it's interesting because Albert Camus, he actually says, religious people are the worst for this. Religious people are the worst for this. And then finally, there are those who rebel against the absurdity of existence, believing that the only way to cope is to resist it and therefore just get on with life and enjoy it. And they are called absurd heroes. They are called absurd heroes. Do you think, this morning, do you think it's absurd or irrational to believe that life has meaning or purpose? If you believe life has no meaning or no purpose, then what's your purpose? Why do you even exist? Have you committed philosophical suicide by fooling yourself into believing in religion to help you cope with an other, otherwise meaningless existence? Are you here this morning? Are you watching in here this morning because religion helps you cope with an otherwise meaningless existence? Or are you or are you an absurd hero believing that the only way to cope and really enjoy life is to rebel against it? So my question this morning is this. Is your existence, is your life meaningless? Think about that. I would be, that will speak to you. 
you because I was speaking at Brennan's funeral some time ago and all being heard me saying was life is meaningless without Jesus and that the Holy Spirit used that and used that and used that and being kind of for them so he gave his life to the Lord but that's my question to you this morning to you watching on Facebook or listening to the podcast <coughs> on YouTube is your existence is your life meaningless I'm going to read this morning from Psalm 139. I'll read it fast. Uh, Psalm 139 says these words. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and, all, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light upon me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide you from me, nor I from you. But the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed me, you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sun. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. For they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know me. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now the author of this psalm, or this song, was King David of Israel. And he experienced many, many hardships, many challenges, many difficulties in his life. There were periods when it looked like he just wanted to give up and die. He had had enough. He couldn't cope with life anymore. He, it seemed pointless to him. It seemed meaningless to him. It seemed that there was no purpose whatsoever in life. Constant battles with his enemies. Daily family struggles, including one son, conspiring to murder him and other family members despising him in their hearts. Overwhelming guilt, shame and disgrace for some of the wicked actions which David committed, including adultery, murder, the deaths of a newborn son and the death of an older son. These and others are just some of the issues that took their toll at different times in David's life and no doubt led him to despair of life. You see, when everything is going okay, it seems you know, life has purpose, life has meaning. I was singing all the way from Banger up to Rathcool last night in the car, I had a miserable week and singing to the Lord and praising and worshiping the Lord in the car. I'm sure the pastor's five thought Luther. And I keep telling myself, I just let on, on the phone. It was on <laughs> and I just sing and praise and worship the Lord. But it was a wonderful, wonderful time. But probably most of the week up to that point felt like it was meaningless and purposeless 
Um, you know, you just like, I can't be bothered with this anymore. When everything is going okay, life seems to have purpose and meaning. But when things go wrong, it's so easy to be led into thinking that life has no meaning or no purpose. We all have our struggles. We all have our mental tortures, our heartaches, our troubles. But these should never lessen a person's value. Whatever a person is going through should never lessen that person's value. We should never allow our struggles in life to take us down a wrong road, leading us to believe that we're worthless, that we're valueless, and that our life has no meaning or purpose. When we're overwhelmed, when we're struggling, when we're facing harsh realities, life challenges, leading us to think that life has no meaning or purpose, we have to become absurd heroes with a difference and rebel against this lie. The greatest absurd heroes are not those who've committed philosophical suicide, nor are they those who don't care whether life has any meaning or not. Rather, the greatest absurd heroes in life are those who know the way, the truth, and the life. The greatest absurd heroes in life are those who know Jesus. Those who trust in Jesus understand truths not only about this life, but also about the life to come, about the world Let's just look for a moment at some of the wonderful insights David gives us, some of the incredible truths that he gives us about life. Now remember of all of the things that he was going through at different times, all the times where he was filled with despair and just wondered whether there was any meaning, any purpose in life at all, yet he had incredible insights given by the Spirit of God. And he tells us in Psalm 139 this. The Lord knows every one of us intimately. So intimately. He knows everything about us. And yet he loves us. What an incredible truth. Because when you're going through something, and I know I'm talking to a person at the moment, and they're really struggling with things that are happening in their life, and they're angry with God, and they're nearly cursing God, and wishing that they could die. And they're saying, why is he putting me through this? Why is he allowing these things happen to me? And they're questioning everything about their faith. They're questioning everything about God and about the word of God. And they're struggling and they are in despair. They need to get back to the truth of God's word and hold fast to it. That the Lord knows every one of us intimately. He knows everything about us. And yet he loves us. This is what else. David says, the Lord formed us in our mother's womb. Before we were even born, before we were even thought about, the Lord had thought about us. And it was he who knitted us intricately together in our mother's womb. It was God who brought us forth into the light of day. It was God who knew that he would preserve us in our mother's womb. It was God who knew the plan he had for us. The Lord formed us in our mother's womb. David goes on, the Lord, he says, the Lord has fearfully and wonderfully made us. No matter how bad you might think about yourself, no matter how all of the accusations of hell come against you and tell you something contrary to the word of God, you need to believe the word of God. You have been fearfully and wonderfully made. There is not another like you on planet Earth. Some of us may say, thank God. <laughs> but you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. And it was God. God took time in eternity thinking about you. And he intricately, every wee detail knitted you together in your mother's womb, looking forward to that day when you would be brought forth into the light of day. The Lord fashions, is what Paul was trying to say, or David was trying to say, the Lord fashions, he designed a plan 
for all of your days. Before you were even born, God had a plan for your life. This is incredible stuff because you think you became a Christian just by an act of your will. Of course you have to believe the gospel, but it is God who gives you the ability to believe the gospel because God formed you in your mother's womb. He knew you before the foundation of the world. He chose you in Christ so that you would be his. And he brought you forth into the light of day to fulfill the plan that he has made for your life. Then David tells us, the Lord loves us. Is that what he meant? The Lord loves us and he assures us, he promises us, no matter where life may lead us, he will be there. If I were to fly to the highest mountain, you're there. If I were to go into the very depths of the sea, you're there. You cannot get away from God. Those whom he loves, he will never forsake. He will never abandon. He will always be there for those that are his. He will always be there for those who believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then David says this most beautiful of all. Hands up anybody here when you sin, you think God's angry. Yet 
he loves us. He who formed us, who marked out all of our days, he wants us to know him and to enjoy him. See, to know God is to know life. It's not about knowing purpose in life. It's not about knowing meaning in life. To know God is to know life. Jesus said, I have come. I have come into this world that you might have life and have it abundantly. So here's a harsh reality that I want you to consider. Without Jesus, life really has no meaning or purpose. That's a harsh reality, but it is nonetheless a reality. Without Jesus, life really has no meaning or purpose. Without Jesus, you are merely existing, and the future holds only the prospect of a meaningless eternity. Meaning in life versus no meaning in life. This is the absurdity of existence. The satanic lie that life is meaningless, therefore you are meaningless, is absurd. And therefore I'm asking you to become an absurd hero with a difference and rebel against this lie and find life and find meaning and find purpose in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, you already are an absurd hero who has rebelled against the lie that life has no meaning or purpose. You resist that lie, and it doesn't really matter. You resist that lie because you know the truth, because you know Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. You've trusted in Jesus, who came to make known God's love and his plans for you. You know, Krishna, that life has meaning and purpose because Jesus continues to give you the abundant life that he promises to those who trust in him. Having all of that doesn't mean you won't face harsh realities. Doesn't mean you won't face life challenges. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have struggles and heartaches and troubles. But you will be able to face them in the knowledge that he who loves you, who fearfully and wonderfully made you, who has a plan for your life, whose thoughts always towards you are precious, he will never leave you, nor forsake you. But he will be with you always, even unto the end. The Lord will be with his people. He knew you before you were made. He then took the time to make you. He put you in your mother's womb. He brought you forth to the light of day. And he knows the plans that he has for all of your days. And even when you step out of that, when you go around in a circle of doing your own thing until you come to the end of your strength and your resources, until you come to the end of yourself and end it back to God's way, even in those times, his thoughts towards you are always precious. The Lord will be with you always. And he will keep you in his love. Maybe there's someone this morning here or someone watching on Facebook or on YouTube and you're not yet a Christian, you're not yet a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you this morning that your life can have real meaning and real purpose. But it can only be realized in Jesus. Without Jesus, and it's a harsh reality, but you can check the word of God for yourself and see if what I'm saying is true. Without Jesus, you are merely existing. And all you have to look forward to in the future is the prospect of a meaningless eternity in hell. Meaning in life versus no meaning in life. This is the absurdity of existence. I urge you today, become an absurd hero and rebel against this lie. Become an absurd hero with a difference. Rebel against this lie 
and find life in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. To do that, the Bible is clear. You must confess your sin. That means agree with God that you are a sinner. Repent. Turn around from living your life in your way. Turn around from your sinful ways and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And let the Spirit of God fill your life so that you can become in the power of God and serve here with a difference. Serving and honoring the living God. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, this morning we want to thank you that those of us who know and love Jesus are in that sense absurd heroes with a difference. We're rebelling against the lie, the satanic lie that life has no meaning or purpose. We're not committing philosophical suicide and just trying to live life and enjoy life, knowing in our heart of hearts that it has no meaning or purpose. We know that our lives are meaningful. We know that our lives have purpose. How do we know? Because your word tells us that you, O oh God, knew us that you, Lord, created us, you formed us in our mother's womb. You brought us forth into the light of day. You know the plans that you have for each of us. And all of your thoughts towards us are always precious. Lord, in light of that truth, in light of the good news that people can come to know you, that can, people can be adopted into your family, that people can have life forevermore, cleansing from sin, all because of Jesus. Whoever believes in Jesus has life. Lord, thank you that we have received that life. And we want to walk in the abundance of that life, being those absurd heroes. To tell others the good news of Jesus, that they might become heroes too in following him. Lord, thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Of all, thank you for Jesus, because in him,